we're back. <laughs> we, um, so we want to welcome you to the ASA podcast where we believe truth is the cornerstone to your success. This is episode three and we are ready to rock and roll. We have Ricky and Andy on today's call. Yep. Hey guys. How's it going? Hey. And how are you doing, Ricky? Your first time on the podcast. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, thanks for having me, by the way. Oh, you're part of the team. You got to be on more. <laughs> first of many. Yeah. And for people that didn't see, um, Ricky joined our team a few months back. Uh, we sat down. Ricky went through the whole co-movement trainers course. Um, had a huge base of uh, knowledge prior to even finding us. And it was just sort of an automatic fit and um he's helping us out here uh joining on the podcast hopefully many more with him um he's helping us build out our achieve uh online fitness program and um mm -hmm. it's just exciting times growing onwards and upwards and we're lucky lucky to have him yeah thank god for ricky because <laughs> he did a lot of work there man yeah he's all behind the scenes to get off the ground without you <laughs> well thanks i really appreciate it yeah, Ricky, tell us just a little bit about your background. Um, I know you have quite a background. Um, so just tell the uh, viewers a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into our episode. Yeah, so I've always been into fitness and, you know, things along those lines ever since I was probably like 16 years old. And I did martial arts when I was younger. I was in musicals and things along those lines in high school. And I also did a lot of singing. But then as I went into college, which I went to West Virginia University, I got my bachelor's of science in chemistry from them. And then I, and I also have a dance minor from that institution as well, which I really enjoyed. And it really helped me with the whole movement thing, which you know, kind of aligns with all of us. And then after that, I went into the military. So I served as an officer in the Navy for about four years, mm -hmm. went back to school to further my education. So I have my PhD in uh, biochemistry and physical chemistry. And, you know, throughout that whole time, I've just been training some of my friends and colleagues along the way. And then when I found you guys and you guys opened your doors to me and, you know, I took that course, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, now I'm here. So... That's awesome. Um, what, um, what, what did you do in the Navy? I know you've explained it to me before, but I think it'd be very interesting for them to hear what you did. Oh, so I was a nuclear engineer in the United States Navy, as well as I also joined uh, another type of force, which was it's called VBSS, which is Visit, Board, Search, and Seizure. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of something where you take down contact vessels and search them for, you know, um, Illegal substances, let's say that. Right. Yeah, <laughs> badass. <laughs> uh, and thanks for your service. <laughs> oh, thank you, Andy. Yeah, for sure. When you um, were looking for gyms and whatnot before Co Movement, why did you, what brought you to us? Like, I'm just curious because there's a, obviously a lot of people out there dabbling in health and fitness. What yeah, was, I'm curious about this too because I don't actually know how you, how you found us. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting journey. I, I, you know, have been going to the YMCA for a long time and it's kind of just a gym that was close by my house and I reached out to them, but you know, they said I didn't have any of the credentials. They said, ah, oh, you don't have a degree in nutrition or all, oh, you don't have a degree in, you know, physical therapy or any, you know, or exercise physiology or something like that. And I don't have the certifications mm -hmm. at that time. And so you know, they didn't really give me a look. I went to Planet Fitness and they didn't seem to care either. They didn't really care about like the knowledge that I had or, you know, the experience I had. They really just wanted to see what I had on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. But then um, finally, I, I also reached out to you guys and, you know, you guys kind of opened the door. We sat down, we had our first discussion. You know, I, I got along with you really well, you know, Josh. And I thought that, you know, the way, and the ideas of what you guys do at co-movement were really aligned with kind of like what I do. And I, I just thought it was a perfect fit. And, you know, I went through the course and, you know, luckily you guys saw the potential that I had and you brought me on board. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that some of the other places were looking for like credentials and like pieces of paper and certifications and all of that. From the beginning, and Andy and I have talked about this a lot, like 
we don't really look for that um, up front. It's sort of more or less the personality and the whole process of has that individual seriously walk that walk up yep. till meeting with us. And then if they check those two boxes, um, great personality, people, person, and they've been actually walking the walk themselves and not just like, you know, an armchair quarterback type status, then we can take over from there as far as training them, mentoring them and whatnot. And you definitely had that, like you have a vast background with that. So, and then we just did some training and here we are on a podcast. So mm -hmm. yeah, the experience counts far more than the uh, weekend certifications, <laughs> you know, all, all the time you've spent over the years training and learning and learning on your own that, that's way better than anything you're going to get in most certification courses. A yeah, lot of the best I, I, trainers don't have any certifications and some of the, some who aren't as effective have 15 of them. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've interviewed, you know, a handful of people in 10 years with a lot of like letters behind their names and all these like things. And I just ask them basic questions about assessment or program design or anything. And it's like, you know, all they want to name off is like muscle groups. And I'm like, I don't know, like, I'm not really, you know, getting that. So it's, um, it's just a different perspective. It's not right or wrong, but it's cool. Andy, what are we talking about today? What are we going to get into? Well, it's going to be our first, I'm going to try to rotate topics on this podcast. We'll do some fitness stuff, maybe the next week, some nutrition stuff, maybe some mindset stuff. Um, I've got some other ideas too down the pipeline, but, uh, so yes, last week we did a, a nutrition, or I'm sorry, a, a fitness topic. Mm -hmm. So I figured today we just do like kind of a really basic nutrition topic where we cover um, <clears throat> kind of the fundamentals and maybe just kind of our approach and what we do just to sort of get people, uh, let them see what our mindset is regarding food and kind of get them on the same page with us. And then we can dive into deeper topics in future episodes. Because one thing with nutrition is, man, <clears throat> we're going to hit a few, you know, several subtopics today, but any one of these things could be a whole podcast in itself, mm -hmm. you know, and down the line, if we do more advanced episodes, I'd like to do, you know, a, a, a pod, you know, an episode on lipidology, an episode on different hormones, even maybe even a single hormone, you know, um, and so on. But today we're going to try to keep it surface level and just cover the basics. Um, should be a pretty easy one. Yeah, awesome. enjoyable yeah and we know yeah. nutrition is is paramount to yeah. everything mm -hmm. you know yeah. not just lifting more weights or running faster but life <laughs> yep health health we, we all want the longest health span that we can get and nutrition is going to be you know 80 or 90 percent of your results there you yeah. know with the other 20 percent coming from your activity level and yeah some yeah. lifestyle stuff too obviously but for sure for sure yeah. So you want me to jump right into this thing? Yeah, let's do it. I'm pumped. Nice. Cool. Ready. Well, the first, the first one thing I wanted to say right off the bat is just um, because we're getting into nutrition and something I've noticed a, a trend in, in fitness these days, because I follow a lot of bloggers and, um, you know, fitness experts and gurus and so on, you know, is it, it's, it's really weird. Uh, nutrition is becoming kind of religious, <laughs> Um, so one thing I wanted to say right off the bat, like before we even begin is I'm, I'm very much anti dogma. Um, people tend to fall into camps. They're, um, you know, they're, maybe they're vegan or they're low carb or they're high carb or they're, you know, there's, there's people who find their, their way of eating that maybe works for them or whatever. And then they think that that's like the prescription for everybody. Yep. People are so individual. Like, I think it's really important to remember that um, there's a lot of different approaches that all work. And one thing that I'm trying to check myself on all the time is making sure that I'm constantly learning and always questioning my assumptions, questioning what I've learned up to that point, because my, my uh, um, approach and uh, just, you know, the, the things that I think that I knew five years ago, you know, changed after five years, you know, I mean, we continue to learn. So, I don't know. That's, that's part of the idea behind this podcast is continued learning. And I'm sure our podcast listeners will see us do that in real time as the episodes continue, you know? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that right off the bat, mm -hmm. but I figured the first topic, the uh, subtopic maybe we talk about here is, um, the difference between diet versus way of eating. 
Um, and the way that I would think about that is because, you know, a lot of people will say that they, they want to diet or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's also the way that we eat regularly, you know, through the year and in our regular life most of the time. Um, I would say that diets are, my terminology anyway, is that a diet is for weight loss usually. That's why people are going to diet. And diets are temporary. Usually it's like one to three months, something like that. You know, you've got the holidays just went by, winter went by, you're eating too much food. And now you're like, you know, I want to lose 10 pounds before summer. So you Mm -hmm. go on a diet for a couple months to lose some weight. That's a temporary thing. Um, Usually pretty much entirely what that involves is just lowering your calories a little bit, Mm -hmm. um, assuming that you're already in a good, healthy place. Um, I wanted to say, let's see, diets, (laughs) diets tend not to work for like, 80 or 90% of people a lot of times um, because they're not fixing the, the root cause of weight gain and poor health. Um, and, you know, the root cause is usually more unhealthy eating habits, and unhealthy behaviors. So a person can lower their calories for, like I said, a month or two, and they can lose some weight. But if they then go back to their regular way of eating, which wasn't so good to begin with, then it all comes right back. And a lot of times they're worse off than when they started. Um, So that's like the yo-yo dieting thing that we hear about all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the biggest problems with diets is that they, they're usually done in almost kind of a a self-hating or like punishing sort of mindset. You know, it's like people look in the mirror and they decide one day, I don't like what I look like. Oh, I hate this about my my belly or my arms or my legs or whatever. And I, and so they start to restrict their calories and they want to, you know, the mindset is always like, I'm trying to punish myself because, oh, I got flabby and I want to lose some weight now. Um, And that's, that's not a good mindset to be in. Um, You know, we're all about taking care of ourselves. And a lot of that is having empathy for yourself and self-love and and trying to take care of yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to say was the difference there is the way of eating that involves your, your general habits. You know, that's like your, your regular patterns that you adhere to long-term. That's like the other nine or 11 months out of the year when you're not dieting. Um, And, you know, these are your usual foods, your usual meal times, the the typical amount of calories and macros and stuff that you eat. Um, And on this podcast today, what I want to talk about, what we're going to be talking about exclusively is your way of eating. That's what we want to like focus on when we talk about nutrition. Um, It's far more important for your overall health, right? You know, it determines your long-term health, um, whereas diets are just quick fixes that often end up reversing once you're off the diet. Um, Yeah, and I think maybe the last thing I'll say on this before uh, I let you guys chime in is... um, you know, the way of eating is where you spend most of your time has the largest impact on your health. And what I like is if we're going to clean up our way of eating, then now we're practicing kind of self-love or self-care. You know, you're, the reason that you're, you're taking these steps to improve your, your regular way of eating is because you care about yourself. You care about your long-term health. You want to live a long time. You want to be free of disease. You don't want to be overweight. So you're actually taking step. It's not a punishing thing. You're actually taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, did you guys, I don't know if either of you wanted to chime in on the uh, diet versus way of eating thing. Yeah, Ricky. Does that make um, sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Ricky, start off with that. I think, uh, yeah, that's a great, that's great, Andy, for sure. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I never really, I guess I never really uh, thought about it like that. I never thought that, you know, maybe people thought negatively of themselves and it was kind of more of a negative thing and a thing that they were kind of punishing themselves. I thought that was very, an interesting approach because for me, I would say I'm always dieting. I mean, not by your terms or your definition, but you're always trying to eat well. Right. And it was, and it was that, you know, whole mindset where, and if you don't enjoy the foods that you're eating, you're never going to stick to it. Right. So that was the biggest thing for me was, trying to find those healthy single ingredient foods that I enjoy eating and preparing them in a way that made them taste better. Mm -hmm. You know, not just eating plain broccoli or boiled chicken or anything Mm -hmm. like that, but, you know, adding some flavor to it. And, and then, you know, whenever I'm in a bulking phase, you know, I, you know, 
over my calories, determining my maintenance was a big thing. Once I knew my maintenance, I could then determine my bulking. And then for specifically dieting, which is kind of what I'm doing right now, yeah. you know, I, I limit myself to X amount of calories. Like currently I'm at like 1600 calories yeah. a day, but then on the weekends, I'm allowed to have more. So that's kind of where I'm at with my diet and how yeah, I approach you're, things. You're using dieting in the right way. You have a good, healthy way of eating pretty much all year long. But right now, before mm -hmm. the call started, you said you wanted to lose, you know, whatever, five or 10 pounds, maybe going into summer. So mm -hmm. you can take the next few months, like you said, you've lowered your calories. And yeah, that's exactly the right approach. But it all starts with a healthy way of eating. Yeah. You know, like a healthy long. mindset. Yeah. Yep. And then you just yeah, cut the calories when you want to lose a little weight. Yeah. 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 Simple. Yeah. I've seen, um, you know, from a generalistic approach, again, generalize that, yeah, diet can have more negative connotations than positive. Again, it's how we frame it. Like, Rick, you framed it really well. Like, yours is positive for positive manipulations and you're eating healthy pretty much all the time, sustainable, and just changing some macronutrients to get what you want up or down with weight. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, I'd say the general person is dieting. Um, and I define diet for the general person as unsustainable. Mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah, that's why I said short term. Yeah. yeah, so like, you know, um, losing 20 pounds, um, eating less calories, you mm -hmm. know, maybe eating foods you don't want to eat, um, versus like Andy said, the 90% or 95% of the time eating for life, like uh, something that you love and enjoy and take pride in. Um, I think we beat ourselves up with feeling as though we need to punish ourselves to get to a certain area um, with dieting, especially around the new year and whatnot. When that's not true, um, I think that we can really take a more positive self-love approach from um, eating clean whole foods mm -hmm. sort of all the time and then experimenting with that instead of labeling it a diet for a month or two months or until I get to X goal. Um, that's a, I, to me, that's pretty unhealthy. I'm not saying it doesn't work for some people and it can get very specific, um, you know, with competitions and this and that. But I'm saying from the general's point of view, they would be much more uh, better off putting their time and energy and positive time and energy into exploring the, um, you know, eating healthy all the time and then experimenting within that as opposed to um, just a diet for a quick portion and a quick result that A, isn't fun or enjoyable and is not sustainable. And so, you know, you may have hit your goal, but I don't know. I would rather like to enjoy the process along the way. And there's a way to do that. Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. Yeah. What you don't want is someone who has like a really unhealthy, like no, typical nutrition plan. They, they eat pretty, pretty poorly most of the year. Mm -hmm. And then they decide that they're going to diet. And that involves they're, they're, they're getting rid of all the bad foods and stuff. And they're, they're going to go on good, healthy foods or whatever foods they don't like, but they're going to force themselves to do it. And then they lose some weight, you know, they, they hit their goal or whatever after a month or two, that's, or three or whatever. And that's fantastic. But then at the end of the diet, what do they do? They go back to their regular way. So mm -hmm. you really want to make sure you've got a, a good, healthy way of eating in place beforehand. And then you can just manipulate the calories when you want to diet. Yeah. And yeah. I've seen a, a pattern with diets um, where people will dig so deep into that hole with, um, I call it suffering, <laughs> where <laughs> they feel when that's over that they deserve yeah. X, but what X is doing is is reversing the suffering. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that's just an emotional component. And so um, do they deserve that? I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't have been suffering for so long anyways. Um, right. Just sort of enjoyed that process. Uh, I see it all the time where you get someone, you know, that has killer results over 60 days and they're really on it. And then they go away for two, three, four days and they're just totally hammered and eating like shit. And they're like, you know, I, I've really, I've really been on, on the boat and, you know, I deserve this. And I don't think that you get those feelings when you're level the whole time, eating clean, enjoying life, you know, on the same wavelength, instead of this, like, 
you know, tsunami of like yeah, the roller coaster up and down, up and down. Tsunami, and you're talking about the magnitude there of the excursion. Yeah, because that's really what it is. You want your diet to be as minimal of a change from your regular way of eating as possible. Like you just normally eat healthy, and then it's like, oh, I want to lose five pounds. I'll just eat how I usually eat, but lower the calories a touch. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that's a yeah. lot easier to do. And then you're not when you get off of it and you go back to your regular way, you're not blowing it up with uh, a massive change in the wrong direction for sure yeah and i'm i mean i think it's also important to to allow yourself a little bit of those guilty pleasures within your diet you know because i mean everyone has it right no one's perfect you know i like chocolate i can admit that and so if, but what i tell myself is that i'm going to eat all the healthy food and all my get all my macros in and get all the you know good stuff in and then after i can finish that if i still have room for chocolate or whatever it happens to be then yeah. i'll just eat a, i eat a lot less and i tend not to binge and then i don't really crash diet you know afterwards yeah, yeah. that's a really good point and we're going to come back to that one at the end <laughs> yeah you know, i want to throw something in there because that is a great point um, and, you know, Andy, me and you follow that same principle for, for the most part. Um, but I will say that that leeway that you're talking about, Ricky, varies dramatically from person to person. <laughs> <laughs> so like our leeway, maybe a few cookies or like, you know, you have a beer or mm. something and it's, you know, every few weeks or a month or something like that versus someone else that defines that totally differently um yeah, their cheat day is like all of my cheat days for the year combined into one day <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so that is i think that is a very healthy approach if it's defined and is clear with um where they want to go within that and you know what i'm saying if that makes mm -hmm. sense um because that can that make sense totally different for a lot of people <laughs> So let's hit another little thing here. Um, this should be a quick one, but I like to take an evolutionary perspective and I'm curious where you guys are going to fall into this. Actually, I'll ask you. So there's a lot of like diets out there, you know, the whatever, Atkins diet, zone diet, you know, Weight Watchers diet, uh, raw 30 or whatever they call it. You know, there's, there's a million of them out there, right? Out of all the, uh, the mainstream diets, um, which one do you think most resembles? I know none of us probably subscribe to like a specific diet or anything like that, but which one do you think most resembles the way that you usually eat? Um, I don't know. Yeah, because it's hard for me to put a label on it. I would say I probably think the closest to paleo. Yeah, that's that yeah. was my answer. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the closest to that only because I'm constantly asking myself, like, would a caveman eat it or would our ancestors <laughs> eat it? And is it recognizable in the form of did it come from an animal, a plant or the soil uh, or a tree, right? Like, or the ocean, like, is it even recognizable? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's sort of a baseline. But yeah, I would say paleo, Mediterranean diet there has, you know, a pretty decent base. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I definitely don't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I subscribe to anything. No, 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 neither do I. But I would say that out of all like the mainstream, if someone came up to me and said, what mainstream diet book should I go get from Barnes & Noble? I'm usually like, well, if you're going to pick one of those, just buy like, um, you know, the Paleo Solution by Rob Wolf. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Primal yeah. Blueprint or whatever. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's probably the closest to, uh, to how I eat generally. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because, like I said, I like to take an evolutionary perspective. Like, don't forget that we're, we are animals. Um, we've evolved over the last 200,000 years. And, you know, we've evolved to eat certain things. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense not to stray from what our bodies are designed to recognize and utilize for fuel. Um, we basically still have the same genetics as our ancestors did, mm -hmm. um, who are robust and healthy, you know? So it's just to tell the visitor, or yeah, the visitors, the, um, the listeners, paleo in its simplest terms really just means eating more like our ancestors. Basically just recognizing that in the last hundred years, we've introduced all sorts of processed man-made foods that never existed throughout all of human history. And a lot of these are contributing to some of the health issues that we have today, most of them. So mm -hmm. like Josh said, um, trying to think of how a caveman would eat, you know, just real food, plants, animals, 
cavemen didn't have pizza and donuts and Oreos and Pepsi, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ricky, do you follow like a paleo approach? We haven't talked about food a lot with you yet. Like, are you on that train or very? Yeah, from that? I would say yeah. that I'm, that's probably the most closely related to mine. And in some cases, I would say the OMAD diet or the one meal a day diet mm -hmm. sometimes aligns with my own. Mm -hmm. But um, that's more of my own busy schedule and mm -hmm. other things. And I, and I do it for other reasons because I think there's other positive effects for that. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're thinking about caveman days, I'd say that's probably the most closely yep. representative yep. of that. So Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, they sometimes went a couple of days without getting a meal, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a book I want to throw out also, because um, Andy threw out Paleo Solution by Rob Wolf, is The Story of the Human Body by Daniel Lieberman. Uh, oh, I like that, Lieberman. He's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. that yeah. book had a profound impact on me. Um, it's a pretty deep read. Uh, most people can get through it. But if you want to take like Paleo Solution and go deeper um, into like your ancestral roots and stuff with food, movement, lifestyle, blow your mind. Um, so I would highly recommend that to people that want to see the back end, you know, from some of that. Yeah, good recommendation. Um, okay, so the next thing, I've got a quality first for health. Um, and I think, I know, Josh, you, uh, you focus on food quality more so than almost anything else. And this is a bit of a, it's a bit of a paradigm shift almost because, you know, food should nourish your body. Like that's, that's the reason for it. But nowadays with access to so much food out there, um, you know, any, pretty much any food you want, anytime the grocery store has a million items, you know, most people choose food based on taste alone. You know, it's really become all about just, you know, how good does it make me feel while I'm eating it? My taste buds, basically, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I try to always remember that food is building my body. It's building all my cells, my muscles, my, you know, everything. Um, and I want to put the right building blocks in. So quality always comes first. And generally that means real foods, real whole foods over processed manufactured foods, you know, plants and animals over the, the boxed and bagged and frozen, you know, crafty find in the supermarkets. Um, I want food that my that my body recognizes because my, like I said, my DNA is uh, built over 200,000 years of people eating this and it recognizes and knows what to do with, right? Uh, so real food, real food is nutrient dense. It's got vitamins, minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids, cofactors. Um, whereas processed food tends to be devoid or just stripped of nutrients. Um, real food has a, a complete cellular structure generally. When you eat an apple, you're actually eating like the, uh, the cells that make up that, you know, that apple. Or again, if you're eating a steak, you're getting the, the actual living, not living, <laughs> but the, uh, the cells with its complete cellular structure intact, um, which means you're eating all the organelles, the cell membrane, like everything that's in there. Um, and those are, there's really important building blocks and nutrients in there that we miss out on if we're just eating food that's been manufactured and is really just a carbohydrate, a protein or a fat, you know, but without mm -hmm. the, uh, all the little micronutrients you find in real stuff. Um, real food doesn't have chemical additives. Um, and it's debatable about how, how healthy or unhealthy some of those things are. But my approach has always been keep it as natural as possible. Generally when man interferes with food, <laughs> it doesn't turn out well in the end. And sometimes we don't learn that until like, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years down the line, you know, I mean, how long were trans fats allowed in our diet before we finally realized what they were doing to our health and got rid of them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the last thing I'll say on this point is just that when it comes to even real food, real whole food, quality still matters to me. You know, I'm usually going for organic over non-organic. I'm trying to avoid vegetables that have been sprayed with pesticides and herbicides. I don't want to be consuming Roundup, which is used on a lot of uh, plant products. Um, with my meats, I'm going for grass-fed, cage-free, wild-caught, that sort of thing, as opposed mm -hmm. to the factory farm stuff that's um, kind of diseased animals, you know? They're, <laughs> they're stuffed with the grains that they weren't meant to eat, and they're in horrible living conditions and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what do you think? 
Want to throw in, throw in anything there? Well, um, yeah. Just we will quality, definitely be... quality of food. There's a whole lot to just to go on off that one. That, know, there's yeah, a lot I there. I know. Well, we will be doing a few podcasts on agriculture and like uh, industrial versus organic versus local because that's something that I'm like going crazy over right now. And so for sure, um, I would say just determining like real food versus what we'd call not real food or fake food is the ingredient list. So yeah. like the ingredient list on broccoli is broccoli. Yep. Um, and it's almond butter, good almond butter, almonds. Like, you know, you can't really mess that up. If, if you need to like decipher the ingredient list from like a scientific compound table, then, you know, mm, you know, maybe that's probably not a good starting point. And like Andy said, they're not all bad. I would say probably most of them shouldn't be in our system. Um, but yeah, ingredient list, I think is where I push most people to start um, being just aware. And it's super unfortunate. I will not spend a lot of time on it now because I think it's a whole other topic at some time, but how much the organic market with labeling and, and marketing itself has sort of deceived the consumer mm. um, as far as like organic gluten-free Rice Krispies. And that's still fake food. And you see it with cookies. And so like you can legitimately eat gluten-free and organic with all shit food still. And, you know, that's something that I'm getting really irritated about because I see a lot of families um, that are trying really hard, but the marketing industry is a step ahead of them mm -hmm. and they're beating them. And I, that's part of uh, something that I'm starting to get pretty pumped up about. Yeah, yeah. organic doesn't always mean good. You can find organic junk food and you'd be better off just buying a non-organic real food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you guys more. And I'm, I think what we keep coming back to is that really it should be a single ingredient food. Yeah. And, and when possible, yes, it should be organic. And even more so, it should be local. Like if you can go local, that's the way. Yeah, for sure. But, but, it's you know, <laughs> and you know, not every, I, I have to admit, not everyone's made of money. I wasn't yeah. always made of money either. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I, you know, I, I couldn't afford the organic or I couldn't afford, you know, certain things. Local tends to be pretty cheap if you can find it. So for that's sure. why it's always a better route. Mm -hmm. But you can, sometimes you can make a deal with a farmer who lives right down the street, you know? Like, yeah. Yep. You, Especially I, where I, we live. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's still important to eat single ingredient foods. That's the number like, one. I, yep. Yeah. That should be number one for anybody. And I mean, you can get, you know, non-organic broccoli by the tons for mm -hmm. a lot cheaper than you can buy some of this processed stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also important. Yeah. And, and, you know, Ricky, that's a great point. Like, and we understand that families and people are on budgets for food and food is freaking expensive yeah. um it's yeah. not getting cheaper so a few things with that if your choice um is non-organic or organic or um with a whole food versus not whole food go with the non-organic whole food like you know it's not going to be the worst choice it's actually a much better choice than oreos right so like non-organic broccoli versus organic oreos it's, there's no comparison. So if someone can only choose a non-organic whole food, that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I did that for years. And, but Ricky and Andy brought up a good point with the meeting your local farmer, the average food, I just shot a YouTube video on this today, um, sitting in a parking lot because I heard it on a podcast and I got pumped up, travels 1500 miles mm -hmm. to get to the grocery store. Yeah. That's yeah. messed up when your average local farmer is broke yeah. and can't support themselves, nor are they consuming the, their own food that they grow on their own land. It's all just being shipped away, soaked in pesticides and herbicides, corn and soybeans. It makes and zero sense. Pick, pick before it's ripe, you yeah. know, ripen, yeah. you know, so, and then you're shipping it so it doesn't even get to that full nutrient, you know, packed yeah. point. And the organic salad mixes we're buying are all injected with these gases to help preserve it so it can make that 14 days, you know, across the country. This isn't normal. And so like farmers markets, low, how I would like 
legitimately, like if you could just talk to your local farmer, organic or not, Amish, Mennonite, anyone, and just say, hey, like I'm really interested in buying raw milk or, you know, can I buy a half a cow once a year? What would be the hanging weight per pound? Um, you know, do you mind if, you know, uh, you grow some extra vegetables with your family garden, I pay you for half a share. There are so many ways to get creative um, if you don't want to do the work yourself, which is fine. But these farmers, A, are struggling and B, want to help support local communities, but their only outlet is these massive distribution chains that give these farmers like 7% margins on their food. They can't even eat themselves. And then who's getting rich are the big corporations. We need to hack that middleman out. Totally. I can't wait until we do the regenerative agriculture episode. You get so fired up about this stuff. Yeah, well. The yeah. yeah, lots of reasons. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot to learn about it, but that's awesome. Yeah. Um, before, uh, yeah, let me just, the next one was, I just wanted to touch on processed food a little bit, just to make sure that people kind of just get what it is and why it should be avoided. Um, and processed food really is like, you know, I usually tell people to shop around the outside of the supermarket. We've all heard that recommendation before. That's where the produce is and the meats and stuff like that. The aisles are filled with all the boxes and the bags and stuff that came out of the food manufacturing plant. Um, processed food really took off in like the last 50 or 60 years is when it just exploded. So our generation grew up on it. Like, I mean, I grew up drinking you know, like Pop-Tarts for my breakfast every day. Usually Pop-Tarts in a can of Pepsi. That was my practice. Yeah. <laughs> Doritos I lived on. Um, you know, fast food is everywhere. Uh, Taco Bell, Wendy's, McDonald's, whatever. Um, but the thing with processed food, it's really, it's very, it's almost all the same. Processed food is, if you look at the ingredients, it's primarily made of wheat flour, corn, so either wheat flour or corn, sugar, mm -hmm. and then vegetable oils. That's really processed food right there. And then a bunch of chemicals like, you know, artificial colors and flavors and preservatives and things. But um, it's just like wheat, corn, sugar, and vegetable oil. That's like 90% of the supermarket just in different forms and shapes and flavors, you know? Um, these things, like I said, really skyrocketed in the last 50 years or so. And they became pretty much predominantly what Americans live off of and most of the civilized world now. And then just health problems and obesity and so on skyrocket right alongside them. Mm -hmm. So the issues with processed food are less nutritious for one thing. You know, we already talked about that. Real food it has all the vitamins and minerals and it's complete. Um, processed food tends to be highly inflammatory um, because of some of the things that are in it. Uh, potentially dangerous ingredients sometimes. I mean, like the hydrogenated oils. Um, thankfully, they're finding their way out, but they still exist. Um, and yeah, they just, they significantly contribute to weight gain, obesity, uh, they're designed to make you overeat. That's one thing that like, I don't think people appreciate enough is that processed foods are made for profit. They're made to sell. And the number one, the, the thing that's going to make a food sell better than anything else is how good it tastes. And they're also trying to make them as hyper palatable and as addictive as possible. So you buy more of them. So it mm -hmm. leads to a lot of overeating issues that we see in this country. I just read a chapter in Omnivore's Dilemma on that from, a, from an agricultural <laughs> standpoint on why these food scientists are doing this because we have a surplus of corn and soy. Yep. And so we have no way to get rid of this and we have farmers already drowning in debt. And so to get them some kind of paycheck, these food scientists, which are sometimes by the hundreds in these like a general mills or something mm -hmm. are figuring out concoctions on how to get the average person to consume more calories without knowing that they're consuming it. Mm -hmm. So that way they can use more corn and soy to get off the 80 million acres of corn, you know, farm fields per year. It's mm -hmm. really amazing. The food scientists, they sit in labs and they figure this out. Yeah. yeah. Now, as a biochemist, I'm not going to touch on your point, but one thing is with, you know, when you said it's just a mix of a bunch of chemicals and all this other stuff, well, sometimes they even try to make these, you know, processed foods healthy mm -hmm. by incorporating, you know, nutrients or, you know, in, you know, putting iron in it or putting yeah. other things into yeah. them, right? Yep. Fortifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, 
your body can't even accept those. So the way that we put those in there, your body, your body naturally can't absorb it versus mm -hmm. from just like, let's say broccoli or spinach, you're going to get mm -hmm. more iron from that because your body can naturally metabolize it and incorporate it yeah. versus. So, yeah. So you kind of see that dilemma as well. So that was one thing I kind of wanted to, to bring up on. I don't know if we were going to go that route, but. Oh yeah. I appreciate that. Cause you know, it drives me nuts when I see, um, a box of, uh, you know, Lucky Charms or, or Fruity Pebbles or whatever. And then on the, you know, on the front, it says fortified with 25 vitamins and minerals or whatever. And they, you know, kind of make it out, make it sound, sound, yeah, sound like it's uh, a health Healthy. food almost, you know, because yeah. they got all these vitamins and minerals, but you're right. I mean, that's just, it's completely devoid of nutrition. And then they try to inject it with, with, <laughs> really cheap forms of these nutrients that may may or may not absorb very well in yeah, if you so. absorb it it's very low very low amount so for sure and then the other point is you know you were talking about how they just try to make them palatable and make things taste great and i mean there is that concept of the bliss point yes so i mean they that's a huge them hit that perfect bliss point yeah and so they, they just pump as much sugar in there until the point where they have these test groups. And I mean, there's a point where the sugar is too high, so they don't like it. Yep. And there's a point where it's too low, where it's not as favorable as this one special point. And they do it for all processed foods. Yes. It's amazing. I wish people knew how much engineering went into designing the food to, to be as maximally profitable as possible, which means as tasty and addicting and you know, you keep you coming back for more. Once you pop, you can't stop. That's what they're all going for. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So how about we hit the next one here? Um, I wanted to talk about calories just a little bit. Uh, the question, do or don't they matter? Um, you know, there's a lot of diets and health experts right now who are all trying to promote various books and programs and things saying that calories don't matter, um, which is good marketing because people love not having to worry about calories, not having to track the calories. All I can eat, you know, whatever I want, as long as I'm eating whatever this book tells me to, and I don't have to worry about calories. So, um, I don't know. I'll ask you guys right off the, the bat, like, would you say calories matter or don't matter or what? Uh, there's not really a right answer here. Cause it's kind of like both are right in different ways. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it depends on the person, but yeah, like definitely calories matter, like, yeah. you know, with anyone. Um, but again, depending on your goal, like I don't count calories, um, but I will, but I'm also tracking a bunch of other things like my energy, my strength, you know, different kinds of like levels of recovery and I'll manipulate certain things, you know, based on that. So you could say I change calories, but yeah, calories matter. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you can drive yourself crazy, counting calories I did that once for like a year and it was horrible I was like measuring everything and writing it down and um I don't do that now um I just go by feel and um I'm very very observant <laughs> yeah. um and, and maybe the average person isn't but I think that there's better ways to do it that are more sustainable I think of like counting calories is like what we were talking about in the beginning of like a diet like it's not really sustainable, you know, you're going to go out to dinner and like freak out because you don't know if it's like 600 to 800 calories. That's a pretty low quality of life. So I think that counting calories is important um, to a degree until you reach a level of awareness that you know sort of what works for you. That's just where I wanted to go. It's like I, the ideal place to get is that intuitive eating where like you, you now you know what your body needs, you know, what certain foods and how much of these foods, how they make you feel. And you can go based on, like you said, how you feel your energy levels, if you're recovering from your workouts and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but calories still, they definitely do matter. Like anyone who says that the amount of food you eat doesn't make a difference. Um, that's, that's a little too far in the wrong direction there. Um, mm -hmm. What I would say is, uh, although calories do matter, they're not the thing that you should focus on. So that's just right to your point, Josh. Um, you know, the real changes come when you focus on the quality of food, which we already covered, and your behaviors. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I would say, I guess I'll, I'm just going to scroll down on my notes here a little bit. Um, 
overeating is the main reason that people gain weight and get to like maybe a body shape that they don't want to be at or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but the important thing is under, so what I'm saying there is calories do count, you know, we're talking about overeating, but the important thing is figuring out why you're overeating and correcting those things as opposed to just trying to force the calories lower. Mm -hmm. So we do want to control calories, but we want to do it with our behaviors. And, um, I think, uh, the main points I want to make here are Number one, we already covered processed foods, hyper palatable, engineered to make you overeat. So that's the number one reason that people overeat is too many processed foods in the diet are just going to lead to overconsumption because they're designed to make you do that. And these uh, engineers who have designed the food that way are going to beat you. They figured out your bliss point and you're not going to be able to overcome that. Um, other reasons for overeating though, how about self-medicating, you know, from stress, anxiety, depression, boredom. Um, so, you know, finding, well, we can talk about strategies in a second, but that's a big reason. Um, the, and the constant availability of food, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like Ricky said, it, it's normal to go periods of time without eating. But these days we've gotten to the point where food is always within arm's reach pretty much. And people have gotten to where they're almost, almost afraid of feeling hungry or the second that they feel any hunger, they're like, oop, there's a hunger feeling. I gotta get some food. And uh, I think embracing a little bit of hunger from time to time is actually a really good practice for people to get into. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys want to touch on any of those things? Yeah, I'll, I'll, talk about a little bit on that. I also want to say that I am a calorie nut, unlike you guys. <laughs> so I, I do do that still, but I, I, I also agree that you should be in tune with your body and make sure you know how food affects you. So, well, so I do agree point, with that. Continue, I would say that um, tracking your calories in the beginning is a really good idea because most people, you know, Josh already said, you got to develop that awareness. Most people have no idea how much they're eating. So mm -hmm. I'm really in favor of people tracking and, and figuring out how much they're eating, what their daily caloric intake is like, just so they become aware of how many calories are in the foods that they like and how much they consume daily. That, that, that the awareness comes first long before the, uh, the intuitive eating phase. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sorry to interrupt. You can <laughs> oh, that's fine. Actually, can you rephrase, can you rephrase the question that you proposed to us? Um, well, we're talking about the reasons that people overeat. So like, you know, I said, processed foods being hyper palatable, yes. uh, the self-medicating, um, you know, or mm -hmm. just using it for entertainment purposes, uh, the constant availability of food. And one thing I wanted to get into before we wrap up this section is strategies that people can use to kind of overcome these things a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So like you said, processed foods just aren't satiating. Mm -hmm. So as you eat them, like you can eat you know, let's say 200 calories of Oreos, which I don't know how much that is, maybe like two Oreos. <laughs> yeah, right. Or, you know, you could eat 200, you know, calories of broccoli, which yeah. is, I mean, that's like 400 grams of broccoli. And, and if you don't know, you up like crazy. <laughs> yeah. So the different, there's a huge difference in those two things. I could probably eat a sleeve of Oreos, which has got to be at least 2000 calories. Yep. Or I could eat, maybe 400 grams of broccoli and I'd feel the same amount of fullness. Yeah. So that right there, if you're going to binge something, binge something that's healthy. I mean, I'd rather you binge bananas or binge some sort of fruit. Something real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you already, you hit on the first of the strategies I've written down, which is yeah. to eat real food. That's, that's the number one strategy for, to prevent overeating. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, you want to jump in on it too? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Ricky said, and I do this all the time, is like my cheat meal or day or whatever is just eating more of the things I already like. Mm -hmm. um, so like if I'm eating a half a bar of dark chocolate, I'm going to eat a bar. If I'm going to have, you know, one gluten-free cookie, I'll have four. Like, or I'll make homemade ice cream or, you know, almond flour pancakes. Like it's still healthy. <laughs> but it's just more of that and it may be more than what I need at that specific time but it's where I am and you know it's just that's what I want to do at that time but I'm not binging on like what Ricky said a sleeve of Oreos I'm just gonna binge on more of the good things that I like like the other night we made um like this taco mix like hamburger um cassava chips with like raw cheddar cheese all over it and salsa 
Did you make your like, Java chips or did you buy the? Yeah, no, the bags. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get those too. That's the same Siesta or something brand. I yeah. Think. It's Siete, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I probably had two times as much as I was supposed to. And I just kept going and like, it just was, it was awesome. And I had more than I should have, but looking back at it, it was all healthy. Um, and that I think is a big concept when it comes to like, if you are looking to quote unquote cheat, find things that are whole good foods that you do really enjoy maybe and just have more of them. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that Andy, you brought up that was really interesting is that like stress and like pleasure. Eating. Before you continue, this is, I have in my notes, ask Josh for ideas. Yeah. <laughs> the one, well, you know, we, we talk about this from time to time, how people, a lot of people are stressed. A lot of people are unhappy or, or dealing with difficult things in their life um, or just bored due to who knows what holes they have in their life that they're, mm -hmm. that they're looking for some, some fulfillment from or an escape from, you know, if, if it's something that's stressing them out. Um, and so one of the strategies I had here is involves stress reduction, mm -hmm. but that's a tough one. Um, and it's different for everybody. I don't know if you have any ideas about, about that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the yeah, that we will do a podcast on that. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, I think from a food standpoint, the, the processed food industry has done a great job making processed foods convenient. Mm -hmm. Because the average person is super busy, super stressed, and sort of just running circles. And then their day sort of ends with a bang at 7:30 at night, and then it's like survival mode, and they don't want to like cook whole foods and like, you know, bake something or unprocessed real food takes time and effort to cook and prepare. Yeah. And that's yeah. where a lot of people get jammed, um, whether it's for lunchtime, you know, McDonald's versus cooking the night before, putting in a Pyrex container, you know, chicken, vegetables, olive oil, and whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that takes effort. Yeah. And so the more stressed our society gets and the more our employers work us to death and the more we just take on for you know activities it's the less time we have to put food as a top value and prep food cook food clean up after the food cook in bulk all of that is is a form of energy and time and if we don't have our lifestyle for that there's not there's definitely like some cheats and tips that we can give as far as like good meal prep. Yeah. Or like I'm saying, like, um, you know, if you have no time and all you can do is like run in and out of like, say, a gas station for something like macadamia nuts, sunflower beef seeds, beef jerky, yeah. dark chocolate, whole milk. Like there's there's ways to do it. Um, I wouldn't say it's not a good long term plan, but, you know, the, the stress piece while it is manageable, I think there's a, from a food perspective, we need to have it, like we talked about before, higher on the value list. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying you have no time and this and that and other, every other excuse, it's, it's not a value and it's not good or bad. It's just yeah, it's tough. stress and, uh, you know, just challenges in life. That's a, that's a strong pressure that's really going to, you know, dictate how you behave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I would love to give some tips as far as how people can, you know, can mitigate their stress. But I think like you said, that's a whole different podcast in itself. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think, I think, uh, you touched on something there with the, the convenience aspect of, uh, you know, the processed foods and the less healthy stuff. Um, I think people can figure out how to meal prep, you know, keep a couple things in the fridge that are made ahead of time so that they have some something that's convenient but also good for you mm -hmm. and then like you said josh a really good tip is knowing what the what the healthy convenient snacks are like knowing that a gas station does have beef jerky or you know a bag of almonds or something like that mm -hmm. um or even buying some of those things ahead of time for if you're on the go mm -hmm. uh, that could probably help people out a little bit yeah knowing like local like easy restaurants when you travel because like pre-covid i traveled quite a bit but like chipotle where the Whole Foods with buffets, you know, there's ways to hack this. Like if we're, we were driving back from Nashville to New York in one day, like um, October of last year, and we hit a Chipotle and I bought two meals. 
like I ate one and then four hours later I ate the other. I didn't really want the second one in terms of like, I wanted something different, but it was a healthy choice. Good, you know, decent source on the road, on the highway. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just sort of prepping for this. So that was eight hours of food, mm-hmm. you know, two Chipotle meals. Um, but yeah, from the stress management perspective, I do, I, yeah, I think we should probably dedicate, you know, a podcast to that. Cause I don't want to oversimplify it. Um, right. Yeah. Now that's just uh, something for people to be aware of that that is a, uh, a big issue and mm-hmm. something that needs to be dealt with eventually, probably if you want to really help yourself out. Well, you know, what's interesting is um, when we talk about reduction of stress and more time when COVID was going crazy and everyone was, you know, quarantining and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a lot of feedback and articles wrote on how like families were like cooking more you know, planting gardens, like, um, they just had more self care time. And yeah. it going it, for walks, going for walks. And, yeah, good you show. know, there was a lot of people that I heard from, it was very interesting that said, well, they want COVID to end. They don't want the COVID lifestyle to end being home more family time, less stress, remote work, they didn't want that to end. And, you know, it's interesting to see that where some aha moments happen for people there. That's actually a really good point is um, adding in some, some hobbies or enjoyable activities, uh, a game night with your family, you know, um, visiting a friend once a week or whatever. Um, if you have some going for a walk, you said, you know, if you have some fun activities to do, that's some things you're doing that are enhancing your life and making you happier, reducing stress and stuff. But that's also time that you're not eating. So Yep. That can help, you know, instead of just being bored and being unhappy and sitting on the couch eating a bag of potato chip, mm-hmm. if you can fill your life with some of these more fulfilling activities, that's, a, that's probably the best strategy, to be honest. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, Mark Manson's book that I just finished, Andy, that you recommended to me uh, about hope. Uh, yeah. What is it? Everything is fucked, right? Yeah. Is that a book <laughs> about hope? Yep. Um, fabulous book. And I think that's exactly what you're saying, like with hobbies and stuff, we need hope in our lives for something bigger, better, something to look forward to, social connection, all of that to avoid depression, anxiety, and stress. So Mm -hmm. if there is a tip for stress management, I would say find hope in your life. (laughs) It can be through a relationship, a hobby, um, a big trip. You can get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you you need that, and that needs to be frequently changing. And I think that is, I think Mark Manson talked about that a lot. The number one cause for anxiety and depression is no hope. <laughs> right, right. You know, mm-hmm. they just have nothing to look forward to. They're, <laughs> they're just there. They're just existing in that gray space of sucking, you know, and that's a bad place. And we've all been there. And I have a ton of empathy for that. Um, but formulating hope in your life, again, takes energy. You need to make plans. You need to go out. You need to meet people. You need to, you know, maybe explore areas you're not familiar with. All of that, you will only create uh, hope avenues through those exploration processes. And we need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, it's not always about just uh, being around other people sometimes. Sometimes people get recharged by being alone. (laughs) And I, I, for, I am actually one of those people. So I need to dedicate at least a little time to myself, whether that's I go for a walk on my own or if I, you know, let's say watch a video on my own or just meditate on my own or something like that. Just something that I can refresh and kind of be by myself and with my own thoughts. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm an introvert too. I need my, my downtime. That's when I recharge. Mm-hmm. 